I would invite everyone to move forward, please. Come on, back row. Let's go. That's all right. I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Alice Simon, and as a member of the Ohio Wesleyan Economics Department and as the faculty chair of the Walter Mate Center for Economics, Business, and Entrepreneurship, I welcome you. Um, I would like to welcome all of you, the, our alumni in the audience. There are guests, there are faculty, there are students. And for those of you watching at home via web stream, hello and good evening. Um, tonight's event is sponsored by the Walter Mate Center. And it's funded through an endowment called the Heisler Family Endowment for Business Ethics. The endowment honors graduates James Heisler, the class of 1938, Robert Heisler, the class of 1942, and Bruce Heisler, the class of 1949. James Heisler was born in, locally in Ravenna, Ohio, and was the owner of a company called A.C. Williams, and he was the owner of that company from 1936 until the late 1970s. During World War II, he worked with the Canadian government in the manufacturing of lightweight material for aircraft. He was director of Second National Bank in Ravenna from 1957 until 1978. And from 1976 until 1980, he was on the board of directors for the Society Corporation. And in the late 1990s, he endowed an ethics chair in the Department of Economics and the one that I have the honor of holding. Robert Heisler was also born in Ravenna, Ohio, and was a star athlete at Ravenna High School. He excelled in golf, the business sport. He held the position of executive president of the family business, and he was inducted into the Ohio Wesleyan Athletics Hall of Fame in 1968. Bruce Heisler was a scholar athlete, excelling in football and basketball and baseball and golf. He was an all-American, he was an all-Ohio football player, and he served as an ambulance driver during World War II for the American Field Service. After graduating from Ohio Wesleyan, he served as vice president in the family business, and he was elected to the Board of Education in Ravenna. Today, we have the honor of still working with the heirs of the Heisler family, and through the Heisler Family Endowment, we are able to continue to foster programs in the area of business ethics in the central Ohio area, and to instill the beliefs of the Heisler family in our students regarding business ethics. Robert Heisler Jr., James's grandson, and Robert Heisler's son, is fondly, know, around, fondly known around the Ohio Wesleyan campus as Yank. Yank is not able to be with us this evening. I hope he is watching from Florida, but he sends his regards and good wishes. Yank is a retired dean of the Kent State University Business School and served as the director of the First Energy Corporation. He's also the chief financial officer of Kent State University, and he was chairman and chief executive officer of Key Bank in Cleveland. He was also elected as a director of the Myers Industries in 2011. On behalf of the Economics Department and the Walter Mate Center, I would like to thank publicly the Heisler family for enabling us to present events this evening as well as for many years to come. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Glenn Bryan, who is a member of the Economics Department Management Faculty. Glenn teaches corporate strategy and marketing here at Ohio Wesleyan. 
He serves on the board of directors for the Toronto-based Southbridge Investment Group, and he is an advisor to the Better Business Bureau National Center for Character Ethics, which seeks to help leaders put integrity into action through ethics education programs. Starting last year, Glenn has also been a part of our new relationship with the College Ethics Symposium in Hilton Head, South Carolina, which is now an annual program here at Ohio Wesleyan because of the Heisler Family Endowment. So please help me welcome Dr. Bryan. Well, thank you. Um, last year, Fred and Donna this out for you, Susan. Last year, Fred and Donna Mansky provided funds for the Department of Economics to take four of our students uh, to attend the 36th Annual College Ethics Symposium. The College Ethics Symposium, which was created in 1977, uh, is designed to bring college students together with retired business, business executives and uh, discussion group facilitator, facilitators to engage students in the exploration of ethical decision making. The program provides a forum for students to interact with other students from approximately 20 to 25 different colleges, uh, enact, uh, engage with former executives, and to apply ethical decision making models to various case studies. Um, and of course, there's some time along the way to uh, enjoy Hilton Head, South Carolina, which is where, uh, where, where the uh, symposium is held. It's actually been a, was a wonderful experience for our students. And uh, Fred Mansky is the chair of this sym symposium. He's also an alumni, uh, alum of uh, Ohio Wesleyan. Uh, he recommended and then also financially supported our students' involvement. Uh, so last year, I took four of our students to the symposium, and as I said, it was, a, it was a wonderful success. And I think our students, I continue to chat with them, and I think that they've uh, continued to benefit from that experience. As a result of that, the department has now made the symposium a regular part of our student offering. And I personally want to give my thanks to uh, Fred Mansky for not only providing the seed funding uh, for our initial involvement in this symposium, but also for his, his thoughtfulness in considering the needs of our students and, and also wanting to give back uh, financially uh, to help us make that uh, a possibility. And then I also want to also thank the Heisler family for helping us make this symposium an annual event uh, through their endowment for the study of ethics. And it's because of dedicated alumni, like the Heislers and the Manskys, that Ohio Wesleyan can provide these exceptional student programs. This evening, uh, we're privileged here to have Susan Wilkie as our speaker for tonight's business, Heisler Business, business Ethics Lecture. Um, I have her uh, bio in front of me but I noticed that you also have it in front of you in the, uh, in the uh, uh, brochure. So let me just uh, abbreviate that for us. She's been in uh, government service for uh, 20 years in the areas of public affairs, communication. She's a public speaker uh, through the, uh, with the Ohio Ethics Commission since 2005. She uh, oversees, conducts educational and communication outreach for this group. Uh, she has uh, sp spoken and uh, quite frequently, as you can see in the brochure, prior to the commission. She was in the Ohio uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, also uh, with the uh, in uh, legislative aid to the Ohio ha House of Representatives. She's a graduate of Ursuline College. Uh, selected also to, to speak at TEDx Columbus. Uh, many of you uh, might have uh, taken the time to be able to see that. Her, um, the conference was Ideas Worth Sharing. And she's also interestingly, interestingly been identified as Central Ohio's leading, uh, one of leading uh, Ohio's leading thinkers and doers. 
And I will say personally, we've, uh, we've just come from a dinner where I was at the table with uh, Susan, and she has a uh, uh, deep love for this field of ethics, uh, and I think that that will carry through in not only her personality, but also her uh, lecture and her perspective as well. And uh, it was a privilege for me and I think the others at our table to get to know her over dinner. And I uh, ask you to, uh, that if you would join me in welcoming Susan Wilkie to the platform. Thank you. Well, good evening. Now, if any of you had the burning question on your mind, what will undergraduate students value more, St. Patrick's Day or the Ohio Ethics Law? I think we may have uncovered the, the mystery, haven't we? Be sure to tell them how much fun you had talking about the ethics law tonight instead, okay? Tell them what they missed, so. And I have to apologize. I forgot it was St. Patrick's Day when I got dressed this morning and I was walking out the door and my husband said, shouldn't you like, like put a green scarf or something? What about that one I gave you for your birthday? And I said, I'll look like a Christmas tree. I can't do that. So I, I'm going with the story that I dressed in Ohio Wesleyan colors instead. That's, that's the story I'm sticking with. How's that? Okay, so, you know, the Ohio Ethics Law, and I know you may have, even those of you who were brave enough to come out tonight and, and forego the green beer to come talk about the ethics law, you may very well be thinking to yourself, <clears throat> seriously though, is she going to stand up there for the next 45 minutes and say things like, now everyone, we're going to review Ohio Revised Code 2921-42-A1. Would someone be willing to read this out loud? You know, I, I know that's how sometimes people think about the Ohio Ethics Law, and I hope tonight maybe we can get a different perspective of not just what's in the Ethics Law. We'll talk about that. But really, my fascination and my passion for this is why do we want the Ohio Ethics Law? Not everybody in this room is currently in public service. Not everybody in this room will go into public service. You're going to have different adventures and careers in your lives and after you leave Ohio Wesleyan, and many of us have already had a lot of adventures. You may be thinking to yourself, how does this even relate to me? Well, here's my question. How many people here are in public service? Let me get a show of hands. Who here is in public service in some way? How many private sector people? All right, here's the big question. How many taxpayers do I have in this room? That's why you want the Ohio ethics law. Because here's the thing, no matter what anybody tells you, it isn't about the extremes. Now I grant you, the extremes are either what get people a little annoyed or it's what makes the newspapers, right? We've all heard about a former congressman from a certain state down south, you know, who you guys have heard about Congressman Jefferson, right? Former Congressman Jefferson that, you know, he was under investigation for all kinds of fun things and pattern of corrupt activity and bribery and corruption, all kinds of fun white collar felonies. And when, when the feds searched his home and his office, they found $90,000 where? In his freezer. Now, what do you call $90,000 in the freezer? Thank you. I knew I could get someone to say it. My, my husband has spent his entire adult career in the banking world, Bank One and now Chase. The day that that article hit the paper about the $90,000 in the freezer, my husband nodded quite sagely at the newspaper and he said, ah, frozen assets. <laughs> when a banker says something funny, you really have to validate it because wit's not the number one skill. No offense, Jeff, trusty Jeff, wherever he is in the room. Okay, yeah. You know, so I know that's the kind of stuff that makes the papers, right? So that's what we think about. And all the ethics, all, if they just wouldn't take bribes, we'd be okay. Not really. That's not really what the law is all about. But you know what? It's not the other extreme either. I did a training once and I, you know, Classes like this are fun for a public speaker. You guys volunteered to be here. This is usually a fun crowd to speak to. I'll tell you the ones that are a little tougher. Maybe let's say a state agency that they were told they had to be there. They tend to come with a little less of a jovial attitude to a training about the ethics law. And I did a class once, it was right around Christmas time, and I had a lady who kind of sat like this and glared at me the whole speech. She was very unhappy she had to be at ethics training. But I give her credit because at one point she did get involved in the conversation. Here's what she did. <sighs> Oh yeah, he took a picture just as I was doing this, right? Don't use that one, okay? He raised their hand like this. And I said, yes, how can I help you? And she said, so what you're telling us is, what this ethics law is all about, what you guys at the Ethics Commission are all hung up on, to use her phrase, not mine, is how many cookies state employees might eat during the holidays from their vendors. That's what you guys are wasting your state time and dollars on, right? And of course, me being me, I said, 
Yes, precisely. That's exactly what I went. In fact, after this speech, I'm on dumpster duty the rest of the day. I'll be rifling through trash cans looking for evidence of cookie and chocolate that everyone's eaten. You know, those aren't the extremes. When we talk about the why of the ethics law, everybody in this room who raised your hand when you said, I'm a taxpayer, the why is you, because you have the right to expect that governments, all governments, whether it's federal, state, county, cities, townships, villages, you have the right to expect that those governments operate in a way that represent you, not that benefits the people who get to make the decisions. Now, again, I realize here we could sort of approach this as, well, if they would just be honest, we wouldn't have these problems. You know, again, I think I would argue that notion that somehow there's this issue of if only we had all, all honest people in government. I think that's kind of unfair to assume that anybody who's ever had an issue to the ethics law was somehow lacking in integrity or character. I grant you there are folks who have made egregiously bad decisions and have betrayed the public's trust for personal gain, right? Has that happened? Sure, every one of us could sit here and name stories, you know, whether it's across the United States or even here in Ohio at certain times. We could name those things. But here's the thing you have to understand about the ethics law. It talks to real people, normal, everyday, hardworking public servants and those in the private sector who may interact with government. The reason that you have the right to expect that government has ethics laws in place is because human beings are the ones serving in government. And that doesn't mean we're all going to screw up or make egregiously bad decisions. What it means is, and this is the concept that fascinates me, we human beings don't tend to be the most objective creatures that walk the planet. Has anyone never noticed that? We actually started chatting about this at dinner tonight. Is there anybody in this room who might be willing to admit there are areas of your life about which you might be slightly biased? Who in this room has the most adorable grandchildren in the whole wide world? Could I get a show of hands? Who's the most? Okay, there you go. Right, of course, of course. There's nothing wrong with bias in and of itself, which is interesting to me because it, it, normally if I were to accuse someone of being biased, we'd probably be somewhat offended, right? Are you accusing me of being an ageist, a racist, a sexist? The truth is, bias is part of the human condition. It's not possible for humans to be completely objective about everything. So why does that matter to the ethics law? Here's why. Let's say one day that one of you has to bring your precious little one, whether it's your own child or a grandchild, you're dropping them off at a daycare center before you head off to work or before mom and dad heads off to work and grandma and grandpa are taking them to the daycare center. Or someday those of you who might be moms and dads, you're dropping off your precious little one there before the work day begins. You know, somebody in government inspected that daycare center, right? They do an annual or biannual or every six months inspection. Is this safe? Is it according to health code, et cetera? I don't know about you, but if I were dropping off a precious little one at that daycare center, I'd want to know the person who did the inspection on behalf of that city, county, or state was not financially involved in the business which they inspected. Anybody with me? That's what the ethics law is about. It's never been about just saying, let's just get rid of all the crooks. That's not, that's not fair. That's too narrow. The idea is that people in public service will encounter conflicts of interest. That doesn't make them bad people. It doesn't mean that the law is faulty. What it means is that many of us live and work in the same community. Where you work may also be your home. So here's the thing, we're not going to get rid of conflicts of interest. They're going to occur. The issue is how are they responded to? If I'm in public service, how do I react? If I'm in the private sector and I interact with public servants, what do I need to know about the law? You know, I've been using recently an example. I spoke at the Ohio Department of Veterans Services uh, this past uh, winter. And I tried to use an example that was relevant to them, and I said, let's pretend they're talking about these kind of cool programs they have, that they have this assisted living and these programs where veterans can get funding for different things. And I said, well, let's pretend then for a minute that I worked for the Department of Veterans Services, okay? And um, I'm part of the decision-making group, and I decide which of these veterans get funding for this or that. We're going to put safety equipment in their bathroom. We're going to build them a ramp up to their front door, et cetera. And I'm part of that decision-making process, and I review files and I, you know, yes, no, and need more information, and try again next year, et cetera. And uh, one day, I'm going through these files and making these decisions, and I come across a pretty familiar name. Now, I would disclose to you 
both for the sake of transparency and so that this hypothetical makes sense. And in my real life, I happen to be the very proud daughter of a World War II veteran. My dad's 89 years old. He served with honor during the war, Was part served in New Guinea, fought in the jungles of New Guinea, was part of the first wave of the invasion of the Philippines. Those of you who know your World War II history, no, that man is a survivor, okay? Two purple hearts, two bronze stars, and an oak leaf cluster. You can't tell I'm at all biased about my 89-year-old father here, can you? Okay, so back in my hypothetical job at the Veterans Department, I open this file and I see an application with my father's name on it. Now, I would love to tell you that my reaction in that moment would be, now, Susan, you have a legal and a moral obligation to make an appropriate decision based on the established criteria which protects the veterans who apply for these benefits as well as all the taxpayers who fund the programs in the first place. I would love to tell you that's my reaction. What would my real reaction be? Oh yeah, this is my daddy we're talking about and my daddy gets whatever he wants case closed. Again, anybody with me? Yeah, see, I like, I like to use examples like that because I don't want you to get the idea that every single time someone's had a conflict of interest, that somehow they're now defined as a bad person. That's not the case. Again, the issue under the ethics law is in that moment, how does that person react? What do they do? How do they respond? Well, we all know, what's the appropriate response in that situation? What do I have to do? Yeah, whatever word you want to use, recusal, abstention, withdrawal, whatever word, that is often a cure. I'm not saying always, but is often a cure to conflicts of interest. So I guess I want to kind of start with that why of the ethics law. You have the right to expect that every time you walk into a building that's been inspected by the county building department, you have the right to know that that person's family member wasn't the one doing the inspection, that they're not partial owner, et cetera, that these decisions, these processes happened fairly, objectively, with the public's best interest at heart. So there are a couple areas of the ethics law. I just wanted to give you a little more detail on of how this relates to us. Again, as taxpayers, the things that you might want to know that public servants are subject to, and for those of you in the private sector, again, how this relates to you in your interactions with governmental entities. So the first one, a little more information about this whole thing of conflicts of interest. I think of conflicts in one of two ways, okay? I think of a conflict of interest either as something rather tangible versus something sort of intangible, something that you can't sort of put in a paper bag. So like I'm curious, when you all think of public servants, and I don't care if your examples come from across Ohio or across the planet, when you think of public servants who may have gotten into trouble for accepting things that they should not have accepted. Don't give me names of people. Holler out to me, and I'll repeat them for our web stream. Holler out to me some of the items that public servants have accepted that maybe they shouldn't have accepted in the first place. Yell some out to me. Golf trips, okay, so you know, um, green fees, cart rentals, food and beer, by the time that day's over, that's added up to quite a bit of money, hasn't it? What else? Trips to the Super Bowl, okay, so professional sporting events and hey, we're even going to maybe fly you out there and we'll, we'll, we'll have fun and we'll go out drinking and we'll go have dinner afterwards. What else? <laughs> I don't want to repeat that one for the live web stream. <laughs> so it happened in Ohio, so maybe somebody who orders a massage, let's say, as was the allegation there of someone from Ohio that went to Las Vegas, okay? <laughs> yeah. So, okay, moving right along. Look at the time. Boy, this time's just flying already, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so obviously, we're going to call those sort of gift items, whether it's a professional sporting event, whether it's an expensive bottle of wine, whether it's a trip to Hilton Head, et cetera. Those are the more traditional gift kind of items. Now, the commission actually does receive a lot of questions on this issue of, Susan, is it a big deal if I, in fact, you know, uh, you know, buy a cup of coffee for this city inspector who's coming to my office, et cetera? We get a lot of those questions. So I can give you some rough estimates of ideas and, and sort of guidelines that the commission has given. But I want to talk first, though, about what I like to think of as a little more of a, a nebulous kind of conflict of interest. These are the things that aren't gifts. Things you can't put in a gift bag and say, oh, here, public servant, happy birthday or Merry Christmas. These are those conflicts that arise, again, simply because public servants 
are real live people. They actually exist outside their public job. It's an important area of the law though, and I'm gonna give you an example of how I like to think of these sort of non-tangible things of value under the ethics law. So I'm doing a speech one day to county employees, and I no longer remember which county I was speaking in. I was speaking to county employees. After my speech was done, a man came up to me and he said, Susan, I am so glad that you came to speak to our office today. He said, you know, I inspect restaurants for the county that we're in today and uh, I work for the health department, really like what I do. And you know that gift part of the ethics law you talked about? I really don't worry about that part of the law because the truth is, if I'm at a restaurant and I'm doing a, an inspection and they offer me food or a cup of coffee, I heard what you said, Susan. I know you said a cup of coffee, piece of pie, isn't rising to the level of you know substantial and illegal, but I figure if I'm there inspecting their restaurant, it just looks weird if I'm taking free food from them. So I just decline. And I said to him, sure, I understand. You're right, no one's gone to prison over a cup of coffee, but I understand why you just kind of don't, don't want to go there if you're inspecting their restaurant. Well, then he said to me, however, after hearing you speak today, there is something I feel like I ought to be doing differently at my public job. And I said, really? Tell me more. And he said, well, you know, my parents, they own two restaurants here in the county where I work. And you know, after hearing you speak today, I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't be the one inspecting their restaurants anymore. And I said, you think? <laughs> now this just occurred to you today though was what we're saying. This epiphany is relatively new in other words, right? There's two reasons I like that story. Number one, I think it demonstrates what we said earlier. Not everyone who's ever made a poor decision on the ethics law is a bad person. In fact, why might it have been that this gentleman thought it was no big deal that he was the one inspecting his parents' restaurant. Honestly, holler out to me, and I promise to repeat it for the web stream. Why might it be that he thought this wasn't that big of a deal that he was doing these inspections? Someone yell out to me. I'm an honest guy. I, I, it was on my assignment list. I, this was on my, I had to conduct the inspection. I did it. I did the inspection fairly. In fact, you know what he told me? He told me his parents hate it when he's the inspector who shows up. Why? He's harder on them. By George, no one's going to accuse me of being biased, so he's even stricter than another inspector would be. I believe him. No one's saying he's a bad guy. But here's the thing. Even if this inspector Joe here, we know he's a good guy. His boss knows Joe's a good guy. Joe would never falsify that inspection. Everybody in town knows Joe's a good guy. How do we reassure all 11 million Ohioans, Ohioans that Joe's a good guy? There's no way to do this. There's no way to say that every restaurant you stop in, that you have any way of knowing, you know, other, without the ethics law, that there wasn't some sort of subjectivity that went into that process. You have the right to know that when you walk into that restaurant, that building, again, that daycare center, that whatever, you have the right to know that the government work that preceded it was done with objectivity. That's one area of the ethics law, what I like to think of as the more, you know, nebulous things of value, okay? So the first reason I like that story is because I think it does demonstrate not everybody's a bad person, but secondly, that a thing of value, again, isn't always a gift in a traditional sense. It's not always a ticket to the Super Bowl. A thing of value could be a past inspection an approved, approved permit application, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of promise of a job. It could be, you know, uh, I don't know, a million things that public servants do. That's sort of when I'm acting on something that has a direct impact on myself, family members, or business associates that I have in my private life. That's where that recusal, that abstention withdrawal is required under the Ohio Ethics Law. Again, not just to protect the public servant, although it does, if I comply with the law, I'm safe but on a bigger scale to protect all of you who have the right to expect that those government programs are happening objectively. So then the other area of conflicts of interest is the more traditional gift sort of thing. Now this was interesting, we even had a conversation with this at our table that some folks were saying they uh, have known public servants that if they go to a meeting with their vendor that they're declining a cup of water. You know, no, I'm not allowed to have a cup of coffee. Again, I think it's a little unfair to pin that on the Ohio ethics law. Uh, you know, I just, you know, had dinner with you all, and I'm sure any moment the ethics SWAT team will be coming here to take me away for having salad and chicken with you all, right? I, 
I don't want you to get the feeling that that's what the ethics law is all about either. But we do get lots of questions in this gift arena, again, both from public servants and from those of you who are in the private sector that may interact, do business with, or are regulated by some governmental entity. So here's what the ethics law essentially is saying. The ethics law says public servants can't solicit or accept, okay, substantial things of value from improper sources. Now let me flip the coin over here. The law also says to the private sector, whom I'm going to call an improper source here, but not in a mean way, okay, the private sector equally can't promise, offer, or give substantial things of value to public servants. It is a two-way street in the state of Ohio, right? If I take the free trip to Hilton Head from our, I don't know, IT vendor, we can both be held accountable under the Ohio Ethics Law. Now, I will argue from a communications and PR background that if that happened, which of those two people, the state employee or the vendor, is going to get the headline in the Columbus Dispatch, though? Hands down, hands down. So I would argue you're probably going to hear about public servants even more often, but it doesn't mean there's not an equal accountability for both to do the right thing under the Ohio Ethics Law. So again, lest anyone be offended that I'm referring to as an improper source, please know what that means. All it means is someone even in the private sector, if they are directly regulated by this governmental office, if they're doing business with governmental offices, do private sector companies do business with government? Of course. Of course. You know, you hire a construction company to build a new gym at the public high school. You buy office supplies from a company. Totally normal. So if a company is currently doing business with a government office or they're seeking to do business with them, maybe they've got bids in to get a contract. They've had contracts before. It's possible to have them again in the future. So they're doing or seeking to do business with a, a governmental entity. They're regulated by or what we have a, called a specific interest in matters pending before that government office. That's what we mean by an improper source. It doesn't mean we assume they're improper people or that they have improper motives. What we're saying is they would be improper sources of substantial gifts, things of value, etc. Now, you mentioned already some of the examples of things that we've seen over the years that have been identified as a substantial thing of value. There are things that the Ethics Commission has specifically given as examples of things that are nominal. And they even used in this one advisory opinion that Latin phrase de minimis. Things that are not substantial, they're not illegal, frankly, it's not a problem if a public servant accepts it or if someone in the private sector gives it to a public servant. You know, some of the examples they gave. Oh, I bet if any of you are in the private sector, holler out to me, what are some of the items that your company prints up that has their company logo on it that you hand out to any customer that walks by or potential customer? Pens, what else? What was that? Mugs, mugs coffee mugs. Anything else? Ball caps, oh, yeah, T-shirts. I, I do have to tell you a coffee mug story. I once was giving a speech at the Columbus Convention Center, and I can walk back to my office from there. So I'm heading down the hallway to the Convention Center, and a man stops me in the hallway. And he wasn't in my class, but he came running up to me, and, excuse me, excuse me, and first thing he said was, are you the ethics lady? And I was like, yeah, that's my new time. I'm going to get a cape that says EL on the back, ethics lady. That's going to be my, my next costume for work. Uh, and I said, yeah, how can I help you? Here's what he said to me. I thought you might want to know what I just witnessed in the vendor ballroom. And I'm thinking, if something bad is, call the police. What do you want me to do? He said, no, no, I just witnessed an ethics crime. Now, how often are you walking down a hallway and you identify an ethics? That seems a little odd to me. So I said, Okay, what's going on? And here's what he said to me. One of my colleagues from my office, this will shock you to find out that sometimes people rat on their colleagues for less than pure motives. I know that will shock all of you, right? So he says, my colleague from my office, I watched him, Susan. He went over to this one vendor and he picked up not one, but two coffee mugs. And then he walked over to this other vendor because this other vendor, they had these great big bins of Hershey Kisses. He used both those coffee mugs, went like this. And we stood there staring at each other, okay? I was waiting for him to finish the story and tell me what the illegal part was. He, what, then hit someone on the head with the coffee mugs? What, what's the crime part, right? And he was waiting. I'm actually not sure what he was waiting for me to do. Did he really think I was going to march into the ballroom 
and start like reading Miranda rights to everyone who was walking around with a coffee mug kind of thing. Yeah, this is pretty nominal in the eyes of the ethics law. The commission even said, for example, uh, small food items. You know, has this, whether you're in the private or the public sector, in your years of being a working adult, or for those of you who maybe have had internships, right, in companies, et cetera, what are some of the items that a company might send or receive at the holidays, let's say? Yeah, gift, maybe, maybe a tin of cookies, uh, a tin of popcorn, maybe, uh, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, maybe a little coffee, you know, with little chocolates coming out of it. I have to rely on all of you for my stories here. I have no personal experience with this. People send remarkably few presents to the Ohio Ethics Commission. So I have to rely on your stories for examples here, okay? But yeah, those aren't the kinds of things that the Ethics Commission has said is off limits. The truth is, if a public servant eats a cookie out of the tin, no one is starting an investigation. No one is opening a file on that person. Those kind of gifts, the cookies and the popcorn, that's not dangerous under the Ethics Law. Although, I have to tell you, I do have a dangerous cookie story too, believe it or not. I didn't, you knew, I didn't think I could have a dangerous cookie story. I was speaking a few years ago to about 120 parole officers from all across the state of Ohio. I couldn't think of examples for them. They don't work with vendors, right? They work with parolees, most of whom are probably not in a position to wine them and dine them even if they were so inclined to, right? So I, I'm thinking, okay, example, example. So I said, oh, okay, I got it. Let's say that one of your parolees brings you a plate of homemade Christmas cookies this holiday season. That's not illegal if you accept them. And there was this murmuring in the room, and they all started kind of looking at each other. And one guy raised his hand. He said, okay, Susan, thank you. Good to know. But just for your edification, even if we accepted them, we would never eat the cookies that our parolees bake for us. So it was the first time in my career I had to concede there is something that trumps the ethics law. I think the will to live should even take precedence over whether or not it's legal, okay? So, yeah, but you know, those kind of minor items or like the modest meal, you know, that you can have if you're a speaker at a function, et cetera, that's not what the Ethics Commission has pursued. I want you to understand this because, again, you're a taxpayer. You have the right to know and expect that the Ethics Commission does do its business in a way that protects you. We're not hung up on whether or not someone took a cup of coffee or a cookie last Christmas. When we talk about public servants who have, in fact, been held accountable for some of these substantial things of value. You named a couple of them, you know, the golf outings, uh, maybe a trip, airfare. Uh, gosh, how about construction on a home? Now, I know common sense ought to say that when I say that, you should look at me and say, Susan, that's ridiculous. Nobody would, nobody would take construction on their home for free. That's crazy talk. Has anyone ever heard of any of these examples? over the years? Yeah. You know, again, you have the right to know that's not how government employees or public servants are being wined and dined and giving gifts. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, tickets to a Broadway show. I don't know how many of you remember. Uh, it was just maybe eight, nine years ago. I was relatively new at the Ethics Commission when there was kind of a scandal at one of the retirement boards, the um, state, uh, state teachers retirement system. Remember this one, all the going to New York City on the corporate jets? And I do remember when all that kind of came to light. I I was reading in the paper, just like everybody else, and I saw that one of the things they had accepted were tickets to um, a musical, a Broadway musical in New York City. And I remember thinking, the less ethical part of my brain, which sometimes talks to me and I have to like, you know, override it with my more ethical part of my brain, I remember thinking to myself, man, if you're going to risk being convicted of a crime, wouldn't you at least hold out for a better show than Hairspray? I mean, really? Lay is or wicked, I at least get the temptation a little bit, okay? You know, those are the kinds of things. And, and I will tell you, I'll tell you, the whole sport, somebody mentioned Super Bowl, but I'm going to take it down a couple notches to even more local sports things. This is an area, I do speeches all over the state. And this is an area people don't always want. Any of you parents, have you ever had to tell your child that they don't want to hear it so they choose not to hear it? I see this happen to people when it comes to this sporting thing or those kind of fancy tickets things. You know, it depends on where I am. I won't just say sports. There's different events. If I'm in Southwest Ohio, what kind of questions do you imagine I get a lot when I'm in Southwest Ohio? What kind of tickets do people want in Southwest Ohio? 
More recently, it's been the Reds because I think they've had a couple of good seasons, as I'm told, right? If I'm in Northeast Ohio, do you know what I've been hearing the last few years? Oh, man, the room goes silent when you talk about Cleveland. It actually isn't a sports example. You know what I hear a lot in speeches in downtown? I hear, well, Susan, our vendor, they have an extra ticket to this black tie, you know, gala event at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right? I've, I've heard that quite a bit the last few years. If I'm in Central Ohio, I'm sure you can't guess what kind of ticket is widely sought after in Central Ohio. Of course, you all know, right? The Columbus Ballet. That's exactly right. That's what everyone is trying to get their hands on, right? No, in fact, it makes me kind of sad. My husband and I have been longtime supporters of the uh, Symphony Orchestra in downtown Columbus. You know, I've never seen a scalper outside the symphony. Wait, why is that? Why do we value the Buckeyes more than the arts in Ohio? I'm not sure what that's all about. But yeah, so this is why, this is why I think that area of the law messes with people's minds. Here's why. I'll tell you why. I believe that the average public servant, I, for all of you who are taxpayers, I'm talking about whether it's your village, your city, your county, your state. I believe that the average public servant if offered $75 in cash, would promptly decline. I really do believe most of us would say, no, hey, thanks, that's very nice of you, but um, even if it's not a bribe, don't get in your head that's a bribe. I'm not talking about a bribe. You know, hey, I just want to give you something nice to have fun this weekend. I still believe most people would say, nope, can't do it. What if it's a Buckeyes ticket? to an OSU Wisconsin game or Texas game. And all of a sudden, these very same people that five seconds ago I can have in a room were all heartily agreeing, I would never take cash from that vendor. And when you say it's a ticket to the Buckeye Texas game, all of a sudden they're kind of going, yeah, but it's not a bribe. They've already got the contract and I'll treat them the same as I treat everybody else and it'll all be fine, et cetera. And we want to talk ourselves into things. That's why I think that's an area that I get so many questions at speeches around the state. So again, I don't want you to get the idea that all public servants are being wined and dined on a regular basis. But if you are in the private sector or you're heading that direction in your career, I don't want you to think you can't interact, interact with government employees on a regular basis, that you need to be afraid of them. But I do want you to understand it is different in public sector. If you choose, some of you in, in college right now, if you choose public sector, I, I wish you much joy. I, I have 20, almost 23 years in of state service. And <clears throat> I was nine years old when I started with the state of Ohio, just so we establish that right up front here. Okay, and, and I've had a wonderful career. I'm thoroughly, thoroughly blessed to have done what I've done. But I will tell you, if you choose public service, it is different. There's no getting around it. My husband, I mentioned, has spent his life in the corporate banking world. And I grant you not as much the last several years, but it's not been uncommon at all in his life to do things like come home with tickets to Blue Jackets games or I have to go to the Columbus Crew game with this client and I got to go here and there's a fancy dinner at the country club. Here's my favorite one though, right? On beautiful days, I get these messages on my cell phone. I'm doing a speech. When I turn my cell phone back on, it happens that I get these calls that go like this. Yeah, honey, I won't be home for dinner after all. I have to take a client golfing today. Oh, is that what you have to do today? You're going to get paid to go golfing and you're really bummed about that. Or I have, like, it's like it's this chore, right? Okay, I grant you. In the private sector, that's still perfectly acceptable, maybe not as common as it was 10 years ago, but still acceptable. If public service is part of the future of any of our students with us today, I'm thrilled for you. It's a wonderful journey. But just accept up front that it has to be different. Part of the privilege of being a public servant is accompanied by a restriction on how we interact and how we behave. And I accept that as part of my blessings of doing what I do for a living, but we do it because you expect it, because you have the right to. As a taxpayer, again, you have the right to expect that governments are going to operate in ways that are fair and objective. Now, I'll tell you, the one other thing under the ethics law that we see a lot, and that's the issue of, again, people who have outside interests. I may not just be a public servant. I might not just be a county employee or a city employee or a public office holder. I may also own my own business. I may have this side gig that I do. One of the areas of the law that I try to stress a lot in my speeches is the problem that we still see of public servants selling goods and services back to their own public agency. 
That is still an issue that comes up a lot in my speeches across the state of Ohio. So this is one that I would encourage all of you to be on the lookout for, not in a, not in a oh, we assume something is wrong way, but in a way of just being assured that public service isn't used as a way to make sure my own business is going well. That's not what public service is for. So I'll tell you, I want to give you time for, for dialogue and questions and answers, but I will tell you, you know, that it, it's, it's very clear to me, again, that, that we humans have a way of talking ourselves into believing something's okay, not always based on the facts in front of us. And I'll give you a prime example here, then I want to open the, the floor to thoughts, questions, concerns. But I'll tell you what, I was doing a speech at a county department of job and family services. I I am going to allow the county to remain nameless where I was speaking that day. It was not Franklin County, it was not Delaware. Let's just leave it at that, okay? All right, so I'm speaking at a county department of job and family services. I did a two hour workshop for about 90 people, okay? Great class, everyone was engaged, it was wonderful. They're all filing out of the room and the director of the agency, she says, can I talk to you one on one? Sure, that's fine, happens all the time. People wanna ask a question a little more privately. And she explains to me that there is a program that exists in their county. This is for someone who may be trying to get their life back on track. They've got a client at the Department of Job and Family Services. Let's say she's got a job, she's got an apartment, she's doing really well, she's really working hard to really turn her life around and do some great things. But something happens in her life. She twists her ankle and she can't go to work that day or that week because the doctor says she can't. And she's worried. If I don't go to work, I don't get paid. If I don't get paid, I can't make rent. I'm going to get evicted. I'll be right back to where I was, square one. So there's this program that exists that allow those folks to apply for temporary rent assistance, just so they're, again, they're not back to square one, leaving their apartment, et cetera. And I'm thinking, okay, she's explained this. Well, sounds like a good program to me. If you were in charge of that program and you were approving a client's application, would you forward the rent money to the client or to their landlord? Landlord, I would too. I think that sounds like a good idea. And that she assures me that's exactly what's happening. So, in their county, they have one person. It's not the biggest county in Ohio, so they have one guy who oversees that program for this county. And she says to me, this gentleman has a side business. He owns rental properties all over the county. So not only is this gentleman recommending the program, renting apartments to their clients, right, he is also reviewing applications for the program. He approves them, and so he's issuing county checks to whom? Himself. Anybody in this room have a problem with that as a taxpayer? And here's the thing. The fact that that happened didn't shock me. As the years go by, I'm getting a little more shock-proof, you know? What surprised me was that after we spent two hours together, the director outlines this issue for me, and she says to me, is that a problem? Really? Really? Two hours and we're not sure yet? Here's why I, again, the human brain fascinates me. I'm, I'm something I'm going to do my like, dissertation on this topic of how our brains talk us in and out of things. Here's why I think she couldn't, she couldn't meld the idea of this employee and a crime. And, you know, the ethics law is not a civil law. It's a criminal law. She couldn't meld the idea of this person and this crime being one and the same. And here's why. If this guy had been the kind of person who, you know, the, you know that person, they get to work late, they leave early, they call in sick on Fridays and Mondays and after holiday weekends and they do very little while they're there and they kick puppies in the parking lot on their way out. You know, one of those kind of people, right? You'd be pretty willing to say, I'll bet that guy's breaking the ethics law too, right? Wouldn't you be? Oh yeah, I, I always suspected old Andy there was bad egg, right? That wasn't the case here. The director is telling me this gentleman is a great guy. Everybody loves him. He's hardworking, he's jovial, he comes early, he stays late. Well, I'd probably stay late too if I was going to make a whole lot of extra money out of the deal, right? Yeah. But he's a good family man, he's a father, he's you know, a husband, very involved in his community. She couldn't reconcile this person whom she genuinely liked with the crime. I would argue that's why we need the ethics law. Because 
We need those sort of objective boundaries that we don't have to say, well, I better figure out if this is a problem or under the ethics law. No, you say, you know what, Andy, I think you're a great guy, but you can't do that. It's not nothing against you, you're not a bad person, but the ethics law says, here's the boundary. Here's the boundary that protects the public because we humans are all too faulty in terms of identifying those things. I put myself in that category too. I am willing to admit that there are things I will very readily judge in you that I'll be more forgiving in myself. Is anybody else willing to admit that's occasionally the way our brains go. That's why we need an objective standard like the ethics law. It's well written in Ohio. I go to an annual ethics conference and I'll tell you, every year I come back from that conference convinced that Ohio's doing something right. Because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bipartisan board. These folks are, are doing what they do because it's the right thing to do. It doesn't matter what administration or who's in this office or that office. They follow the standards of the ethics law, and that protects you, again, as a citizen, as a taxpayer. Okay, I better stop now because I promised to leave time for Q&A, and if left to my own devices, I'll have you here at 10 o'clock tonight. Thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, what else do you want to know about the ethics law? Yes, sir, thank you. A preface to his question. He's coming with a microphone. He's coming with a microphone so the web stream people can hear you, too. This, will be a, this is a preface a preface to my question because now you'll understand the question. I happen to be the journalist that broke the STRS story of those Broadway tickets. Oh, all those years ago. Those yeah. Years ago, and it ended up seven ethics con uh, convictions. So I'm asking this as a journalist. You said earlier that your meal was not something the ethics commission is going to worry about. But if you're accepting a quote unquote honorarium yeah. or speaker's fee right. for being up there. Absolutely. Is that something that you'll have to report or oh. and accept? Well, that's a, that, okay, that's a perfect differentiation because did you notice what he said? Is it something you have to report or is it something you can accept? That's two distinct things, isn't it? You know, the truth is I think a lot of people want to make disclosure the safe harbor. The truth is, sometimes if you disclose things, you're just basically admitting you violated the law. Great, write it down for us. We're happy to use this part of our investigation, right? But the issue is disclosure for me is irrelevant for this speech because why? Can't take it. I can't take any money. No, this is a normal part of my job. Free. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, you got me for free. Yeah, yeah. If if you'd been the, like a uh, Cleveland State University, I might have been a little far for me to drive tonight. But yeah, you got me free. Yes, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. The other thing I will tell you too that I think you kind of prompted in my mind. You're right that one time someone feeding you a you know a, a catered meal because you did a speech really isn't. The commission has established that precedent. What if, however, uh, let's say that. Um, my agency, I don't know why I have IT in my brain. Let's say my agency was contracting with an IT company. What if they took me, all right, I grant you a $15 meal one time, it's probably not a huge deal, $20 meal one time, even then. Let's say they take me out to dinner every Tuesday night for 20 bucks. Let's say they do it, you know, 20 times this year. The Ethics Commission has specifically said that a cumulative effect is also problematic under the ethics law. Absolutely. There's no question about it. And I, you know what? It's, it's one of those things I think, I will say, if any of you are ever with a public servant and they decline, if they decline, no, no, I don't want the coffee, I don't want the donut, I don't want the piece of chicken, okay, respect it because I don't know what policies they're operating under at their respective offices. There are some cities or counties that have policies that are even stricter than the ethics law, and that's fine if that's handled in-house. But there is a difference in the eyes of the ethics law of whether or not someone did take a trip to a Buckeyes game or, you know, a Broadway show versus that, yeah, I ran into our vendor at Panera and they bought me a bagel and a cup of coffee. Uh, there, there is a difference in the way the Ethics Commission has viewed that through their advisory opinions. Great question. What else? Other thoughts, questions? Up here. Um, he's right up here. Thank you. You mentioned cumulative, and in your bio, you do 200 speeches a year, it mentioned in there. So if you go to each participating speech and you're given a dinner, uh -huh. is that a cumulative? Does that count That's for fair. yours, or is it a cumulative from a specific agency? That's a great question. And it, it is a cumulative from a specific source. So for example, if we're doing if we're doing a business with that IT contract, I will tell you first of all, meals accompany about 
0.5% of the speeches. The most, most speeches that I give are actually to the public sector, which don't have food budgets at all. But yes, to be fair though, it is. So if this vendor stops by with pizza every Tuesday, after a while, we're gonna start to say, now, is this become an expert? I'm not saying people are gonna go to prison for taking the pizza, but there can be this, this slippery slope in life, can't there? Where pretty soon it's becoming an expectation. I just don't like to have anybody have expectations. If once in a while someone buys you a cup of coffee, all right, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But let's not get down that path of that that's part of a normal working relationship with that company, that person, that entity. Mm -hmm. What else? Anything at all under the ethics law? What else is going on in your minds? Okay. Could you explain, I mean, I think I know this, but maybe the audience might be interested. The relationship of the Ethics Commission to the media, the news media, journalists. I mean, basically, you guys don't talk to us. Oh, that's not true. I talk to the media all the time. But you're not allowed to reveal an investigation. That is correct. Completed. So there are, there are several sections, if you will, of the Ohio Ethics Commission. One is the section that I oversee, education, training, public outreach, media, etc. One is the advisory section. We have advisory attorneys, they average about 3,000 phone calls every year from people who want to do the right thing under the ethics law and need some guidance and a little bit of interpretation law to help them. We also have a financial disclosure section. There are certain public officials and employees that have to annually disclose on a financial disclosure statement some of their personal financial information. One of the other sections is in fact the investigation section. We have investigators who do research allegations of wrongdoing. They follow up to see if in fact there is validity to any allegations that have come our way. And your point is absolutely well taken that statutorily the Ethics Commission and its staff cannot comment on ongoing investigations. Reporters know me well enough now, they call me enough, that sometimes reporters will actually say to me, all right, Susan, I know you have to say it, but could you just go ahead and say it again? Just and I, I can't confirm or deny that there is that investigation going on. And what I have had to help people understand before, that's not a policy that we're invoking. That's state law. It is right in our statute that says we will not discuss what goes on in investigations. And to be fair, while I recognize that may sometimes feel frustrating to the person who may be called in an allegation and said, but I'm the one who brought the allegation to you, I can't get an update. To be fair, there are good reasons for that kind of confidentiality. Confidentiality, for one, it would be tough to build a case if every word we had was already you know, out there in the public's hands. Number two, it, I would say it does protect people from retaliation. That we don't, you know, we, if someone calls us and says, so was it my employee, Frank, that called you with that allegation about me? We're not gonna say, yeah, it was Frank, go get him. Go get him, cancel his vacation, boss, right? And I would also say that it does protect the reputation of innocent people. There are people that we receive allegations about that it turns out they didn't violate the ethics law. It would be quite damaging to good people who haven't done anything wrong if, if it were out there, oh, you know, yeah, but did you investigate them? So there, I think there are valid reasons for that confidentiality, and it is what we are statutorily required to do, yeah. Now, there are times that you've heard about cases that have been resolved, as you said. Sometimes people will accept things like public reprimands. I do news releases on those. But you're right. If you call me and say, what's going on with the Joe Schmo story, I'm going to give you the standard. I can't confirm or deny that there is any such investigation going on. Yeah. I'm wondering, too, if we could go back to your example about the restaurant inspections. Yes. The guy who was inspecting his parents. Yes. Could the argument be made that he shouldn't have been inspecting their competition? I, you know, I, I guess it could, could, it'd be a great paper, wouldn't it? In an ethics class, it'd be a great paper to write. I don't know that the Ethics Commission has, has a precedent of going down that path so much. What I will tell you, though, is I have a great deal of sympathy, frankly, for small communities in Ohio. I think they have more ethics challenges, not because they're less ethical than large governments, not at all. But to be fair, I have to confess, if somebody from the Franklin County Health Department were at all involved in anything dealing with their parents or their brother's business, it's going to be a little hard to elicit a lot of sympathy from me. Because I'm, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, you have 50 people on that staff. Really? Really? You couldn't figure out that somebody else should do it? I admit, when I'm out speaking at certain conferences, I spoke once at the Ohio Weights and Measurement 
Association Conference. And they're the folks that do, I think, like the scales and gas stations, et cetera. And there were two gentlemen that approached me during the break. They're both from Northwest Ohio counties, very, very rural counties, adjacent counties. They are the only inspector for either of their county for doing that work. And ironically, both of them have brothers who own gas stations in their communities. So I do have sympathy. Now, they've worked it out. They, they, the two guys and their supervisors and their county prosecutors, because that's their legal counsel, are all involved in making sure they cross borders to do inspections for each other and bypass each other with the results. They send it over each other's heads to each other's bosses just to make sure those things still happen. So I think there are ways that the Ethics Commission can work with people who are in a bind like that. But I will say, I do think there are times when my heart does talk hug for some of those communities saying, you know, I think about where my husband grew up, not only they all know each other, I think they're all related to each other in that county, quite frankly, right? You can't swing your arm in a circle and not hit someone named Wilkie in that county. I am sympathetic in communities like that where it would be hard not to have some overlap of lives. That's where we would say, don't worry about investigations. Take advantage of the advisory section of the Ethics Commission. Call us before you're in that, you know, before you do the inspection, before you do that grant review, that application review. Call us first. Let our, let our staff help you do good things. Because I, I'm convinced that good people who ask good questions make good decisions, and that leads to good government. I, and really, I think that's really what the Ethics Commission really is all about. So what else? Is there anything else while well, you got me? I love being here, so you can keep me up here all night. Okay, I've got, I've got a hand here. You mentioned that the ethics of violations are criminal violations and not civil violations. Can you describe how your commission then works in association with uh, prosecuting attorneys to bring cases to court? Absolutely. So a lot of our, we actually get a lot of referrals from other agencies as well. Now I will say this, a prosecutor doesn't have to use the ethics commission. A, a local prosecutor could move forward with charging someone with an ethics crime even if we didn't participate in the investigation. I think a lot of them appreciate our involvement because investigators, that's the area of the law they're most familiar with, obviously, and it's not as if they, they have to hire inspectors and investigators, et cetera, that they've kind of got us to help them with that. But we do receive referrals from other agencies, and then to answer your question about prosecutors, what the commission does is they share the findings of their investigation. If they feel, uh, if the investigator brings to the commission their findings and say, it does appear there were some fairly significant wrongdoing here, and it does appear this could warrant prosecution. The Ethics Commission shares the results of its findings of its investigation with the local prosecutors. So like for those of you who remember like the Coingate scam, does anybody remember that? You know, even though a lot of that activity took place in Columbus, where was Tom Noe's trial? Toledo, yeah. So we work with local prosecutors around the state. So we share that information. Ultimately, it is up to the local prosecutor to determine whether or not to move forward on whether charging someone with a crime or not. But the Ethics Commission does have a pretty good working relationship with all kinds of the, the Attorney General and the Inspector General and local prosecutors, et cetera. Yeah. So one follow-up. So if, uh, say, you make a finding that there was a violation but a prosecutor for some reason or other decides not to prosecute, then what, what enforcement uh, Ability. Yeah, statute actually doesn't give us the authority, doesn't give the commission the authority to, to require that a prosecutor move forward. Ultimately, then it does rest on his or her shoulders to make that decision. Do you levy any sanctions independent of the... Not sanctions, but what the commission could do if, in fact, it's, I think it's 90 days, if 90 days after it's been, the information's been shared, that if the prosecutor doesn't choose to do anything, the commission could decide whether or not they even want to acknowledge publicly that they forwarded it. They don't have to, but they can. St statute does allow them to acknowledge it after 90 days if they choose to. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, then let me just close by saying this. I, I hope, that, and I, you, I'm sure you've picked up on that this is the briefest of overviews of the ethics law. We could have delved in, we didn't talk about investments or nepotism or selling goods to state, you know, local agencies and post-employment representation. There's so much more. But what I wanted to do was just to give you a feel for the statute, not in a punitive, scary way, but of why it's so valuable to the state of Ohio. Uh, I've, as I said, I go to these conferences with other ethics agencies, and I'm always fascinated at how much Ohio does to make this state 
a place that you can feel sure that for the most part government is run in a way that's fair. I have a, I have a counterpart in a different state that I will allow to remain nameless as well. And every year at the conference, she looks up our most recent stats and she compares them to hers and says, look, Ohio had this many people, whatever, you know, that they were this or that, or they had this problem or that problem. And look, our state only had this many. You know what my response to that is? If, if you had children at home and you had no rules for them, technically you could argue your kids don't break rules, right? But if you actually have rules and you enforce them, they're probably going to rack up a little more than the next door neighbor who ha don't have their kids accountable for anything, right? So I guess I would argue that we don't look at it as, oh no, look, we've had another public official, another public, look at it this way. It's good when we know that people make bad decisions that we can actually stop it. But it also, don't forget, you know, we receive give or take between five to 700 allegations a year. Give or take between 100 and 150 of them actually result in a more full-scale investigation. Now, to be fair, are there people getting away with things we don't know about? Sure, but what profession couldn't you say that about, right? But I would still argue that even of those that we did know about, 150 out of 600,000 people in public service and that's not just full-time employees, mind. that's your library board of trustees and your zoning board and township trustees. I still would argue that speaks pretty highly for our state. And I, I, you know, I'm, again, completely biased because this is where I'm born and raised is Ohio. I still think of Ohio as a place of really hard-working, ethical, Midwestern value kind of people. Uh, so I, it's a real privilege to be able to do what I do. And I hope that our little taste of it tonight gave you a feeling that this is a good law. It's a positive law. It's well done. And it's here for you. I will offer the Ethics Commission as a resource. If any of you ever have questions, whether you're in government or whether you're in the private sector, and you're simply not sure what the ethics law would say about thus and such situation, you don't have to figure it out alone. You've got a state agency that's available to you free of charge to help you answer those questions. Again, to make Ohio a great place to work, to live, to raise kids, to call home. So with that, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a great honor to be with you, and I hope this has been helpful to all of you. So have a great St. Patrick's Day the rest of the evening, okay? Thank you. I'll turn it back over. Thank you.